Big games, small names, small games, big names, and unknown games from unknown names. This is a list of some of the big March games that you can't miss, which feels weird to say because in the past, March wasn't always a huge part of a year. But in the last couple, more and more games have been spreading out throughout the year to release in staggered timing. And this March is proof of that. Let's get to it. First up is Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection. This is March 14th for pretty much everything. Not many people had a remaster of Star Wars Battlefront as a collection on their video game bingo card for March, but here we are. Remastered by Aspire and coming for every system. The remaster has the bonus maps, palace, and heroes like Kit Fisto and Ventress and brings everything else to the table. Over 12 maps with Galactic Conquest mode in here as well, which has you overseeing a larger struggle across the galaxy versus just multiplayer maps. And that's combined with the Battlefront 1 and 2 campaigns, which has you fighting and refighting the original battles from episodes 1 through 6. Now, with up to 64 player support, the game lets you do just about everything and play as everyone, from Wookiees to Jet Troopers, Fly X-Wings, TIE Fighters, and more, as well as battles that have the main heroes and villains from the timelines leaping into them, which means heroes and villains like Mace, Yoda, Grievous, and Maul, and more. Now, Star Wars Battlefront was an incredible game years ago. While not a full remake, the remaster looks to bring pretty much everything into one playable suite for everyone, which is awesome. I can't wait to smash some logs into an Adat's body and ride around on a speeder bike where safety isn't even the last concern. It's not even one. It's outfitted with single-player PvP, network, split-screen, and co-op on some devices. The game isn't really lacking in chances to get together and see what would happen if Mace faced Vader outside of other side fiction and more rewarding than Anakin just toss him out a friggin' window. I'm excited to see more people be able to play a game that has been talked about as a bit of a legend for a long time. Another legend that's coming and sort of a plot device you're going to notice in this entire video are things from old days coming into the new days, and that's Outcast: A New Beginning. This comes March 15th for everything but the Switch. I covered Outcast A New Beginning in a preview a couple months ago and brought to you by Appeal and THQ Nordic. Outcast is a new beginning, but really just a rethink of the original game release that's more than two decades old now. Outcast is a third-person action-adventure game following Cutter Slade, who's a grumpy-ass Special Forces member who's ended up on a massive planet of Adelpha and has to fight to save the local populace against invading robot forces. Generic sounding? Sure. And it was when the original game came out, but Outcast already looks to be nailing what made that game special, and that's the gameplay. And as a pro jetpack YouTube channel, I can't wait to strap two tubes of rocket fuel onto my back and use their slightly slowed down explosive force to explore the world. Mixing technology and powers from the world itself, Cutter has to take out the enemies across these massive battlefields, survive long enough to uncover the mystery of the world, and then manufacture tech out of the supplies in the game world that lets him absolutely demolish the enemy. This kind of thing from the original Outcast was fantastic, and every bit of the preview that I played looks to have pretty much nailed this. While solidly on the double A side of the spectrum, I can tell you that my time with it was exploring this beautiful world, a wicked upgrade weapon system, and excellent questing. The original Outcast was known for not only a unique graphical look, but also a deep dive into the alien civilization, even wrapping game saves into their mythology and mysticism, and that's something we saw in the demo and the preview of this Outcast. I'm telling you, March 15th is going to be wild. All of March is going to be. And having been created by the original developers of the title two decades ago, I actually feel like this one is in really solid hands. A bit Star Wars, a bit Stargate, and a whole lot of cheesy action movies merged into one sort of hits that love line for me. Next up, Outlast Trials. This is coming out for every system but the Switch as well. One to four players, March 5th. The early access is almost over, Outlast Trials is coming, and it's a typical love story plot. A massive corporation wants to solve mental health, or maybe not, by throwing people into a meat grinder of challenges or therapies as they call them, and those who get out are considered free. Does it make sense? No. It doesn't matter though. It's you and up to three other people who can head out into a dangerous series of tests and are asked to perform an ever-descending ladder of morally questionable activities, all performed by people the corporation doesn't think will be missed. A nobody. And that's you who's technically a somebody, collecting different skills and trying to go out through the world in challenges and escaping your own fears. Now, this is a unique type of game that doesn't push combat as much as progress forward in any way possible. But with a huge amount of blood and gore, if you have a weak stomach, then this game might not actually be for you, as reaching into somebody's body is not even considered level one gross out here. But if you like yourself some stealth, some gore, this might be a title that you actually end up enjoying. Coming out again on March 5th. Next up on March 26th for PC, PS5, and Xbox is Bulwark Falconeer Chronicles. A unique bird, this is created within the same world as the original Falconeer title. 
Chronicles focuses on the construction of epic fortresses and the management of units for exploration and conquest. It's a base-building, war-making, peace-talking title in the same awesome-looking world as the original. Forty years after a last war, you're in charge of creating a huge settlement of one of its kind base to be a bastion of hope and possibly a place setting for the great next battle. While building out the base, you can create new trades and treaties with other nations, as well as hire heroes who can explore and exterminate depending on their own skills and paths. The game looks gorgeous, just like the original one did. This is a unique blend of soft shaded world and pastel colors that is you stretching out your base across a massive ocean, interacting and possibly eradicating those that you meet. It's a bit RTS, a bit civilization, and a basic style game all merged with this amazing looking art aesthetic. However, the most noticeable element to the game is the base building, which the developers mimicked more on 3D asset creation than base building in other games. And that shows there's a natural flow to the building that we see in the trailers. Will this actually be enjoyable in the full game? I actually think it will. It's a natural progression, and it feels and looks more like painting than it does in other games, and I love that. Next up, Horizon Forbidden West, the PC port, March 21st. Okay, here we are. The Horizon series are a group of fantastic games, a mix of neon and robots and dinosaurs in a primal world that's also futuristic. And yeah, all that works somehow with excellent mechanics for survival and crafting following the main character Aloy as she goes through the world trying to uncover the secrets of the world, including how it all got this way in the first place. Forbidden West is just that, Aloy's trip into the West, and the new PC port is going to include a large expansion called Burning Shores that's already been out on the PlayStation. That throws in even more creations, weapons, and lands, as well as offers some massive story building plot points and some secrets I don't want to give out. A weird combination of Tomb Raider with robotic dinosaurs and an almost post-apocalyptic Uncharted vibe, these games surprised me when they came out, and they really keep delivering. Open world exploration and combat on the PC is coming on the 21st with the addition of unlocked frame rates as well as support for ultra-wide monitors and, of course, a bevy of technical options for the graphics. Guerrilla Games knocked it out of the park in this game when it comes to the looks and the design, and I actually do enjoy the combat, and I can't wait to play it on mouse and keyboard because I think there's just a little bit more control there. I also love the story. The late Lance Riddick nailed it as one of the main characters in the game, probably a reason really to play this even if you don't necessarily love the game itself. Having him in there just adds a level of delivery. If you like the idea of robotic neon dinosaurs and massive open worlds with a bit of conspiracy and post-apocalyptic grandeur, this is for you. And you get to shoot a robot alligator thing in the face with an acid-filled arrow. And I think that's pretty much on everybody's bucket list. Something else on everybody's bucket list, Dragon's Dogma 2, March 22nd, on everything but the Switch. I feel like I'm saying everything but the Switch all the time. This is from Capcom. The story here is a little bit weird. It's sort of an alternative world compared to the original, but it's also set in a different timeline than the original. This is you, the Chosen, who has to save the land and do so by fighting huge monsters, beating them in the Nogma with a broadsword that looks like it was made from railroad tracks, or light them on fire with magical spells, or sneak up on them, or drop an explosive on their face, and then let your pawns, which are three other characters that are AI-driven and follow you around like puppies, take it down by killing it in their own fashion. Just like the original game, the player can choose from various vocations. These are skill sinks that align with particular players' tropes and types, with new ones added to the game that look to elevate this gameplay well above what it was prior. Where the original game's classes seem to fit with sort of the dogmatic types we've seen in other games, it certainly does feel like some of the additional ones in Dragon's Dogma 2 elevate and really do tie into the gameplay more so. And Dragon's Dogma 2 directors stated that a lot of these gameplay systems they put in here were brainstorms late at night or after a lack of sleep where weird ideas just took over and they decided, you know what, let's go for it. Like the first game, fighting large enemies is a thing, but now villagers and others can help you out in the battles and your actions are going to have larger reaction bases, not only with your pawns, but other city goers as well with all kinds of social dynamics going on, both noticeable and maybe not so noticeable. This is a large seamless world the developers have also stated is about four times as large as the original game. And in this world, they've created opportunities to use it to help you fight against creatures. For example, undamming a rock dam to flood enemies and more so. They've also made it very clear they want to build on the freedom of the first game and then sort of explode that out to be truly emergent. And even the few hands-on we've seen, as well as the gameplay previews, look to back that up. More abilities, more classes, more enemies, more land, more comments about the world from the pawn AI so they don't sound like an AI program hallucinating the same three sentences again and again, all sound like great ads. In many ways, the pawns are like the wind system in Ghost, helping the player navigate with less HUD use, and the developers have actually stated they're trying to make it even more advanced this go-around. There's probably some secrets in there that we're not even expecting. Capcom is actually coming in hot with this one, and if it hits the spot, 
That means the company's list of recent successes will be some of the biggest in recent years for pretty much any company. They've been nailing it again and again, and Dragon's Dogma 2, from everything we've seen, looks to continue that pattern. Speaking of patterns, here's one I didn't expect. The merging of so many different titles into a single game with a weird name, Unicorn Overlord. This comes for everything. And I do mean all the systems, which is rare for this developer. March 8th is going to see the launch of this title with probably the best name this year, Unicorn Overlord. The continent of Fedrith is in the middle of this massive war, and you play as a prince trying to lead this ragtag group of armies that you collect throughout the game to take down an evil general. Now, this is a tactical RPG exploration game from 13 Sentinels and Odin Sphere developers at Atlas. Developers that you would expect to be able to hit this, despite them merging so many different genres, which I'll talk about in a second. If you expected to see a massive guy riding a unicorn controlling people in real-time battle, sorry to burst that bubble, but what's proposed here looks awesome. It's a combination of triangle strategy, fire emblem, and ogre battle. And this game splits into different audiences depending on what you're doing, really. It's a real-time strategy game for a lot of it, with movement and real-time combat with armies only clashing when they end up in the same square in the game world. And the developers are looking to merge the ideas of all these games into one without hinging on turn-based but keeping the combat chops of their other titles. So this is real time in those areas, but also outfitting groups, upgrading weapons, and taking command of just freely exploring the game world in any way you want. There's a lot of different combination of genres going into just this one game. It can be argued it's got an odd look and style and feel, but so far it actually looks like the developers have put this together into something that's going to be a cohesive package. We'll have to see if it is, but I love the look of it. I love the idea of merging all these different styles of games and just have to say, finally seeing something like this released on all of the systems at the same time from these devs, we'll know more on the 8th. Next up, Alone in the Dark for the PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. This is by THQ Nordic and Pieces Interactive. So Pieces Interactive is trying to bring us back to the Alone in the Dark series on March 20th. Jody Comer and David Arbor are playing the two main leads in a somewhat retelling of the original game from decades ago. This is a search for Emily's uncle, and both Edward Carnby and Emily are exploring this massive manor trying to find out if the evil inside is connected to her uncle's disappearance. It's not just about horror, though. This is also about the play style that both characters are going to have differently, interacting and seeing the world just slightly offset, resulting in a unique viewpoint from each character. I'm curious to see if they can bring this story into the current day, as Alone in the Dark was a bit slow even on the initial release time, and that's what I actually loved about it. When Outlast Trials is on the same monthly game release list, it's going to come down to them being able to leverage the big star actors with a world that has them interact with it differently depending on who they are, and that's going to matter when it comes to both the telling as well as, I think, the success of this title. We've seen this kind of thing before in the past, but a game with such strong characters in it and a subtle nod towards horror and creepy Elder Gods kind of a vibe could really work. David Arbor's an excellent actor, so is Jody. I'm crossing my fingers for this. With excellent puzzle work, story, and smart narrative, they could end up turning this into a success despite it releasing in a rough time. And speaking of rough times, let's talk about Rise of the Ronin, which is releasing in a very rough time, March 22nd, right there in the last bit of March, which is absolutely packed. Sony and developers of Neo and Ninja Gaiden, and if that's not a AAA team, I don't know who is. As someone who loves the battle systems from their prior games, Rise of the Ronin excites me just from a pure gameplay perspective. But the ideas when you read about it and see some of the gameplay videos are very sound. This is only coming for the PlayStation 5. It's composed by Mr. Zura himself and developed by Team Ninja. It's the final years of the Edo period, and after you make a custom character, you're thrown into all the political debauchery and battles of the Boshin War. The developers have said that they wanted to make Japan in the darkest, nastiest time frame, but also allow for massive open world freedom. We see horses tearing down hills and even the character using a glider, because dark times in Japan always mean hang gliding across someone's pagoda, and then using your grappling hook to climb it. It also has a number of firearms, so mixing blades and bullets is on the table for everybody. Nothing like slicing somebody in the face than punching a large round ball of metal through it to really make sure everybody in the game world knows you hate that particular guy. The game even has characters you can join with in the questing and then switch out in real time. Also, the characters that are playable and not playable are still meshed within a bond system that has the ability to turn enemies into friends and friends into enemies depending on treatment. These characters can also impact the story slightly, altering it depending on who you have in your group during those quests. But this is a Team Ninja game, which means combat. It's going to be a massive endeavor for them. They wanted to have their tight combat within an open world. 
and I've spent years trying to make sure that the two actually mesh together expertly, something that is far more difficult than I think a lot of people probably imagine. They've also added a four-player co-op mode, so you can roam the world together. Now, this has been met with a bit of confusion, as while there is no PvP in the game, and they've stated that, the small mentions of the player co-op don't explain if this is the entire story, because even their most recent attempt to clarify this, they stated it was just the game's main story missions. However, I think it's most likely they're just trying to make sure they don't tell too much about the game, because some of those characters may have huge parts within the title. I think it's most likely the entire thing, even though they said it was just the game's main story missions. I would assume what that also might mean is that some of the side story missions can only have some of the characters go because that story mission may be tied to a particular character and they didn't want to make it sound like you could do every single side mission and every single main character when in fact some of those side missions will end up tying to specific characters themselves. Also be aware you will need to have PlayStation Plus if you do want to play this multiplayer with other people joining your game. We're starting to get a lot of companies changing the release dates of their games pretty close to release, and some of these titles I actually could see moving slightly because of just how close they are when it comes to other titles releasing in the exact same time frame. Something, for example, Alone in the Dark did to get out of a heavy release time frame, and now they're right back in another one. So I could see some of these companies adjusting a little bit forward or back just to try to get a couple sales before another big game launches. Because while you may be able to buy all the games in the very same moment in time in a cart, it doesn't mean you can play them all at the same time. And these companies really want to make sure that you have the ability to do that. Especially when you look at April, May, and June, there's some openings there for a lot of titles to be released. So I could see one or two of these actually having a late day movement period. Will you see reviews of these games from me? Yeah, most of them, if I can get the code. And if I can't get the code, I'll probably still end up getting them and talking about them at minimal on the podcast. But expect more game reviews coming from me, actually, in just a day or so. Make sure to subscribe, please, and hit the notify all bell, because if you don't, with so many different channels on the web, it's very easy for you to miss a release from me, especially as we get into the busier parts of the year. Peace out.